Welcome MCC members. If you submit images to the club's monthly competition, this video will explore how to prepare your images for optimal digital projection. First, let's go over the setup of the Memphis Camera Club digital projector. We use a Canon WUX500, which is a three chip liquid crystal on silicon display, which is considered the most color accurate for projectors. It also has a brightness of 5,000 lumens, uh, which is especially good for large venues like our auditorium where we hold our competitions. It has a maximum resolution of 1920 by 1200 and it operates in the sRGB color space with 8-bit color. When we set up the projector, its distance and height are calculated using Canon specifications from their website. It is also calibrated twice a year using the X-Rite spectrophotometer and software. The projector's resulting ICC color profile is available for download from our website and we will be talking about that later in the video. Preparing an image requires the proper resolution and color space be selected. Let's look first at resolution of your image. As I mentioned before, the resolution is 1920 pixels wide by 1200 pixels high. For the best results is to match the 1200 pixel height and let the width float. Visual Pursuits, the software that we use for submitting images to competition, will resize a maximum image size of 3840 by 2160 down to the 1920 by 1200. However, for best results, I would encourage you to use your photo editing software to resize your image. The reason being is photo editing software such as Lightroom or Photoshop have very sophisticated algorithms built in to resize images and will give you the sharpest, best image. So now let's go to Photoshop and we're going to demo uh, how to resize your image. Before we get into the mechanics of resizing your image, Let's take a look at what our goal is here. Our goal is to make sure you have the sharpest image projected possible. Uh, in Photoshop here, I've created a square that is 1920 by 1200 with an aspect ratio of 16 to 10. What that means is for every 16 units of length, the image is 10 units high. Unfortunately, photographs don't match that. Photographs from a 35 millimeter full frame or a crop sensor are three to two, or for every three units of length, two units of height, which is a little more square than the 16 by 10. What we're trying to avoid here is to send the projector an image that is significantly smaller or significantly larger than its native resolution because what happens if you do that is the projector has a scaler inside of it and it's going to make that image fit inside its native resolution and when it does that you're going to have a less sharp image so let me demonstrate here by turning this layer on to show you uh, what a 3 to 2 ratio or 35 millimeter a photographic image is going to look like in the native resolution. So we respected the height of 1200 pixels and we let the length float to 800. So we lose a little bit of resolution on the side, 60 pixels on each side, but we get the full resolution of the height of the projector. Now you might ask, well why don't we just use the full length and let the height float? Well, the problem there is if you do that, then you're going to get uh, sizes 
that are greater than 1200 and when you send that to the projector the projector is going to downscale them and you're going to lose some sharpness so that's the reason that we're going through this exercise so next let's take a look at resizing some images we're going to show you two different ways to resize a photograph. So here's a full-size photograph from my uh, Canon 5D Mark IV, a full-frame 35mm sensor. If we go up to image, image size, we can see that it's a 6,000 by 4,000 pixel image. The simplest way that Photoshop has to resize an image is a little trick they've programmed into Photoshop. If you go to File, Automate, and Find Fit Image near the bottom. Instead of worrying about what the size of the photograph or image is, you just have to tell it what are you targeting what size do you want it to fit into so in this case it is our Canon projector so if I put uh, 1920 for the width and 1200 for the height Photoshop will figure out what it would take to fit that image inside of that constraints so we say okay we go to image and look at image size you can see that it calculated for us uh, taking advantage of the full height of 1200 and letting the width float on its own okay that's one way that probably the simplest way second way let's take a look at this image here which is in portrait mode if we go to image size again under the image menu uh, you can see that this is a 3800 wide by 5100 tall now it will preserve the the ratio of the image if this little chain is checked if it's unchecked you can enter any disconnected numbers you want you don't want to do that because you'll change the aspect ratio so make sure that this is checked here now remember that we're going for the height of the projector so we can enter 1200 here and it'll calculate a width of 900 since it's a portrait it's going to use a much smaller uh, width area now to go back to what we were talking about before just to demonstrate it, let's say I said, well, I want the 1920 width, but look what it calculates for the height, 2,500 pixels. Well, 2,500 pixels is not going to fit into the 1,200 maximum pixels of the projector. So if this photo went in, it would compress it and throw away some information. So you don't want to do that because you've worked hard to make it as sharp as possible so uh, let's go back to the 1200 and just say okay and it resized uh, the image for us okay the next program we're going to look at is Lightroom. Lightroom operates a little differently on how to accomplish the same thing which is resizing your photos well, we have this uh, image that we used in Photoshop. Now we've pulled it up in Lightroom and going to resize it also. But the concept's a little different. In Photoshop, you actually resize the photo inside of Photoshop. But Lightroom, you can only resize the photo upon exporting it. Um, so what we need to do is need to right click on the image and go down to export and select export and it has many options on the export dialog that is beyond the scope of this video to go over so we're just going to go over to the image sizing option first thing is is to check resize to fit it has several options the option that you'll want is width and height and this is similar to the fit image option in Photoshop. So if we go in here and our width is 1920 
by 1200 uh, which is the target for our cannon uh, that's what we want here and I didn't mention it in the Photoshop video but I want to go ahead and talk about it here you'll see resolution resolution has nothing to do when you're targeting images for a monitor or projector those are fixed pixel displays so the the pixels per inch have no bearing on that so you can ignore it uh, whenever you're trying to size for um, a monitor or projector all right so what we'll do here is we hit export I already exported this once so I'll tell it to overwrite and up here you'll see the action showing the file has been exported I've brought up my uh, file explorer now to where we exported our uh, photograph so let's uh, right click on it and bring up the property screen and look at details and you can see right here that it resized it properly with a width of 1800 and because it floated and a height of 1200 to use the maximum resolution of our Canon projector okay so that's it for resizing images in Photoshop and Lightroom to get the sharpest image on our Canon projector. Next, we're going to dive into uh, how to convert to the color space of the Canon, and if you're set up, how to soft proof against that Canon profile. Well, we finished the first part of prepping your image, and that was resizing it to the proper resolution for the sharpest display on the Canon. Now, we need to move to the color space. Our projector uses an sRGB color space with 8-bit color, and your images must be converted to that color space. If not, they're going to look very different projected. Visual Pursuits does not do this conversion for you, so you have to make sure your image is in the correct color space. Once you do that, uh, to make further adjustments, the best way to do that is to soft proof against a destination ICC profile, which the club provides and you can download. However, there's one caveat to that, is that unless you're calibrating your home monitor, it's a hit or miss situation to try to soft proof against another ICC profile. So if you're not doing monitor calibration, I would suggest you just do your correct uh, color space conversion and that's it. If you do calibrate your monitor, you'll be interested in this last part. So we're gonna do the demo in two parts. We're gonna do uh, Photoshop and Lightroom just doing a strict conversion uh, to sRGB. Then we're going to come back to Photoshop and Lightroom and do a demonstration of soft proofing against the club's provided ICC profile. We're going to take this image in Photoshop and convert it to the Canon's preferred color space, sRGB. So you would go up to the Edit menu and go down to convert profile now you'll see right above convert profile is a sign profile that sounds very similar but it does not do a conversion all it does is change the metadata so you don't want to do that it's always convert profile so let's go ahead and pull up that uh, dialog box and take a look at it you can see up here that the source space the photo uh, is in Profoto RGB, the largest color space there is, and it has to be converted down to sRGB. Here in the destination space, for a photographer, the only thing you'll ever be concerned with is the RGB destination spaces. Right now we have uh, Adobe RGB selected. You can see the list here. Uh, right below uh, Pro photo, we have sRGB, and that's what we want to select for the Canon projector. 
Then coming down to conversion options, uh, leave the engine at Adobe Ace. It's considered the uh, best conversion engine. That's the algorithm that actually takes the colors from one space and converts them to another. And rendering intent. There are four here. The only two that photographers are concerned with are perceptual and relative. Most of the time you want to select relative. It's beyond the scope of this video to get into all the ins and outs of what's the difference between the rendering and temp. You can say that relative color metric leaves most of the colors as you see them and then translates colors that are out of gamut in other words that don't fit into the srgb color space and converts them to ones that do perceptual is different it it will move around all the colors to gain what they call an overall perception of correct color balance and that can be useful with a uh, very uh, saturated photos uh, which probably most of the time will not be the case so choose relative color metric most of the time and keep use black compensation checked and say okay and now it did the conversion so that's it at this point we could save this image out to a jpeg you'll also note that I said that the Canon projector is SRG color space with 8-bit color. This is 16-bit right now, but as soon as you save it to a JPEG, it will create an 8-bit JPEG because that's all JPEG supports. So you'll have a JPEG that is sRGB and is ready to go on to visual pursuits and be submitted for your competition. Next, we're going to look at doing the same conversion, except in Lightroom. You can see that we've brought up that same image in Lightroom. Now, it works a little differently in that you're not working directly on the photo. You have a raw photo in Lightroom. Changes are being put into its database, but those changes aren't baked in until you actually export the image. So just like we did for the resize, we're going to go to export to set the color space. So we go up to file and we go to export and it brings up our uh, image dialog and you can see where we had been doing the resizing. We go to file setting and the format we want is JPEG, which by the way uh, is the only format that Visual Pursuits accepts. And then here is a list of our color spaces and we're going to choose sRGB. We can put the quality up to 100 and if you wanted to limit the total size of the file uh, you can do that here. And then all you do is hit export. I've already exported it once so I'll override it and you can see the process going on here and that's it so you've written out the jpeg and you've converted it to srgb uh, it's ready to bring up visual pursuits and point to where you wrote the file and submit it for competition next up and our last segment is going to be about soft proofing in the previous parts of this video, I've been talking about soft proofing. So let's take a second to define what soft proofing is before we uh, get into the demo. It's simulating a destination color space without actually doing the conversion. So let's say your raw photos in uh, Adobe RGB but our Canon projector is in sRGB. This will allow you to see what the results are going to be before you actually convert it. And the reason for doing this, it gives you a chance to make an adjustment to your image so it looks better in the destination space, um, especially when you have out of gamut colors. However, for this to work reliably, your monitor must be calibrated. In other words, you need to start in a known baseline ICC profile for your monitor before you can compare it to another ICC profile, in this case the Canon projector. 
So we calibrate the uh, Canon projector twice a year because the lamps age and the colors drift a little bit. And that ICC profile is available on the memphiscameraclub.com website under competition guidelines. And you'll see us download that in the demo. We're also going to demo how to load your ICC profile into your operating system, whether it's Windows or Mac. And then we're going to go to Photoshop and Lightroom and demo how to do soft proofing since they work a little differently in each program. The first step in soft proofing is to get the appropriate ICC profile to proof against. The club calibrates our Canon projector twice a year and then puts the resulting ICC profile on our website. So if you go to our website and go to the competition menu and then go to competition guidelines. Scroll down to the digital competition guidelines and right here on number five you'll see a link to download the profile oh by the way the next link is a link to this video that you're watching so if we click here we're taken to a OneDrive and here is the uh, last Canon profiling so you just hit download and it's downloaded and put in your download folders. The next thing we're going to show you is how to install this ICC profile on Windows and Mac OS. Now that we've downloaded the Canon ICC profile, which you can see over here, we can install it on our Windows 10 machine. There's a couple of ways to do that. You can uh, double click on it or you could right click on it and in the context menu you'll see at the top install profile. Click on that. Unfortunately you don't get any feedback but you can check to see what profiles are installed on your machine by looking up the color management control panel. If you go to the All Profiles tab, it lists all the profiles installed on your machine. So if we scroll down, uh, you can see the profiles uh, for my monitor there and for my Epson printer. We go down to the bottom here and we can see that it installed the Canon profile. If we click on it, we'll see the date it was created and it was in the RGB color space. That's it. It's installed now and it's ready to be used by color managed programs such as Photoshop and Lightroom. The next thing we're going to go over is how to accomplish the same thing in the Mac OS. For Mac OS, the process is a little different to install the uh, color profile. Uh, it doesn't have an install feature, so you have to move it to the correct place. Where that is, is a folder called Library, Color Sync, and Profiles. However, that's a hidden system folder, but we'll show you a little trick on how to get to it. Now, I don't have a Mac myself, but uh, Patrick Thompson, one of our members, uh, did some screenshots for me, which is what I'm going to use to show you how to do this. So I'm going to go to my uh, screenshots of Mac. And the first thing is uh, go to your Go menu and hit the Downloads folder, and you bring that Finder up. That's the first thing. So that's where the uh, Canon profile was downloaded uh, from our website. Then the second thing to do to get to the hidden library feature, what you want to do is hold down the option key and go back to the go menu and then the library uh, folder will be revealed. So hit that to get to the library folder. So now what you should have is you should have a finder up for downloads and a finder up for your library. So all you're gonna do is drag and drop the Canon profile from the downloads folder to library, 
color sync profiles and here it is right there you don't have to do anything else once you put it in the uh, profiles directory uh, any program that uh, recognizes ICC type profiles will know it's there just as an aside for Mac users Mac also has a product a free utility called color sync which is an excellent utility on for color managing uh, in the Mac OS so if you don't know about it uh, it's free and you might want to check that out okay well we're going to go on to uh, now that we've got our profiles downloaded and installed on either our PC or our Mac using uh, Photoshop and Lightroom to do the soft proofing. Now that we've added our ICC profiles to our Windows OS or our Mac OS, it's time to do some soft proofing in Photoshop. But what we need to do first is tell Photoshop where our profile is. So if we go up to the View menu, Proof Setup, and Custom, this is where you can create a preset basically for your proofing. You see I already have one here for the Epson Platine paper that I use. Uh, so first thing is what device do we want to simulate? So here are all the profiles that are loaded into my system. If I go to the top up here, I can see that Canon WUX500 that we loaded. So let me select that. Uh, <clears throat> again, relative uh, rendering intent, I'm going to pick relative color metric. You can change it later if you want to see the difference between them. And the next thing I'm going to do is do a save so I can come back to this and I'm going to it creates what they call a PSF file which is a Photoshop proofing file so I'm just going to call this Canon projector all right and say okay so if I wanted to simulate how this would look on the Canon projector I would go back up to view and you can see the Canon projector is selected and it's always going to appear now here so uh, whatever profiles you set up for various papers you print to or projector you're gonna uh, show your images on that'll be here okay over here is the proofing toggle control Y so you'll be using that so if I say control Y look what happens here this is the uh, photo um, being displayed natively as I edited it and when I do control Y here it adds Canon projector on there now if it was the Epson paper it would add its title up there so you know which one you're looking at. The next hotkey that you're going to need is this one called Gamut Warning. Shift Control Y. What it does is based on what you're proofing against it shows you what in this image is going to be out of gamut or that the device, in this case the Canon, uh, cannot produce accurately. And it's going to, unless you do something, it's going to make some decisions on how to reproduce that. So the next thing I'm going to show you is how to make those changes to your image for the device you're proofing against. It could be printing, as in paper, and that could either be printing yourself or printing to uh, for a lab you can do the same thing in this case I'm going to show you what we need to do for the Canon projector now that we've uh, downloaded the ICC profile for the Canon projector and we installed it and told uh, Photoshop where it was let's say that we had this image that we wanted to submit for a uh, digital competition uh, one of the first things I would do before I did anything is to check to see 
uh, how far out of gamut any of the colors are. And if you remember, if you could go up to view, and we want to make sure that uh, we check our proof setup and that the Canon projector is selected, then we can turn on gamut warnings either by this menu or using the hotkey shift control Y. Uh, so as you see here, these gray spots are showing all the areas that are out of gamut that will not be reproduced correctly by the uh, Canon projector. What will happen is with the rendering intent, uh, intent selected, it will uh, try to change those hues to match what it can do in its color space. So I'm not happy with this, so let me see if I can do something to adjust this image before it's submitted to a uh, competition and the projector and it might look closer to my original intent. So let's do shift control Y to turn this off. First thing I want to do is duplicate this image. I'm going to do a side by side as I make uh, changes to it. So if you go to image and down to duplicate and what it does is it takes the file name and just adds the word copy here on the end and I'll say OK and it adds it as another tab so what what I do is really just pull these tabs out that one and pull this one out which is our copy and I put them in my workspace side by side so I can see the work I'm doing on them. Notice that this file name is highlighted and this will tell you that that is the current one that would be worked on and here is our copy. So the first thing I'm going to do with the copy, notice that it says it's 16-bit color and remember the Canon projector is only 8-bit color. So I'm going to change that to 8-bit before I start. So if you go up to Image, Mode, and 8-bits. So it's now 8-bit color. Okay, so uh, let's do our shift Control y Okay, we can see everything that's out of gamut. So what I want to do is make some uh, non-destructive adjustments. So I'm going to use adjustment layers most of the time to see if I can get some of uh, these colors back in gamut. So one of the first things I'm going to do is use levels. And in this case, since m all of the problem is with the background, all the, the subject animal here, does everything is in gamut, so I don't have to worry about it. But if I start making adjustments using levels, it's going to adjust the entire photo. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a mask uh, to uh, just affect the background. And there's a fairly easy way to do that. You go to your tool and you select quick selection tool here and up at the top you will see select subject click on that what will happen is Photoshop does the best it can to figure out what is the subject of this image and it did a real great job outlining this uh, caracal here so that selected the animal but I really want the background so I want to uh, reverse that and I'm going to do shift control I and that is going to inverse that now that I have this selected uh, I need to make it a mask on that layer um, you can right click on the layer mask and click on select and mask and this is allows you to adjust the mask if you need to in this case we really don't need to so down here at the bottom it says how to output the selection so we're going to output it as a layer mask so we're going to say okay and you can see right here that it masked the animal out uh, it's all black 
black conceals, white reveals, and so any adjustments we do will only be on this background. So we're going to double click on uh, the properties for the levels, and if we bring down some of the uh, darkest levels, we can see that we are getting rid of most of the out of gamut. Okay. So that's that's pretty good. So that takes care of that. But it's, there's still kind of a difference between it. I see two differences. One is the shadows have lightened up quite a bit. And the hue between the two are quite different. Uh, so I think we can get some of that back. Maybe not exactly as the larger color space, but a lot closer. So I'm going to go ahead and add another adjustment layer. Uh, this time I'm going to add uh, hue and saturation. So uh, I'm going to try to uh, adjust that and get a little more of that pop back in the green color. Now I, I want to use the same mask I had before. So if you hold down the Alt key on PC or Option on Mac and just drag that mask up, it will copy it over the layer mask. So again, we're only affecting the, the back. All right, so uh, what I, the tool I want to use here is if I grab this tool, it will let me pick a color and e either increase or decrease uh, the hue or saturation. So this right here was, you can see it over here in comparison, it, it is definitely duller. So I'm going to click my left key and hold that down and I'm going to drag to the right a little bit. You can see we're getting a little more out of gamut back, but not as much. So again, if we take a look now between these colors, they're a lot closer. You're not going to get exactly, again, because this color space for the projector is a lot smaller than what I edited in. So the next thing I want to deal with is these lightened shadows. I think uh, it lightened the background up too much. So to do that, I am going to add some contrast to it. So I uh, add another selection here. And again, we're dealing with just the back. So I'm going to hold down my Alt key and copy my mask up there. Okay. Then uh, let's add a little contrast to the background. You can see it's darkening some of those areas, but it's bringing back a little too much there. Let me, and then let me decrease the brightness some. So it's, it's kind of a play between these two to get it to look similar without bringing back a lot of the out of gamut. So let's look at it here. So let me turn off the out of gamut warnings. And now let's look at the two photos. It's pretty close. The cues, the greens are closer than they were. The only difference that I can really see is the shadows are not as dark. Uh, in here and we're not going to be able to bring that back completely without getting back to an out of gamut situation. So where you are here then is this copy of the photo is the one that I'm going to save to a JPEG and I'm going to submit to competition and you can if you're using Lightroom or some other ways you can save this separately as a competition file for digital. Now you can also imagine that if you were working on a printed copy for a particular ICC profile of paper, you could use this to print from and save that for always printing to that type of paper. So that's soft proofing in Photoshop. Now Lightroom 
uh, works differently because it's always working on a raw file non-destructively so we're going to look at that next we've chosen the same image that we used in photoshop to do our uh, soft proofing demo in lightroom to do soft proofing you have to be in the develop module and you can either select that by clicking on the develop menu on the upper right or you can hit D on your keyboard to change modules. Over on the bottom left you will see a checkbox to enter the soft proofing mode so click on that select that and you can see that the background changes colors to white and over here on the right it says proof preview also below the histogram some new options open up creating a virtual proof copy we'll talk about that in a second what profile that you're profiling against right now it is a paper for my epson printer which was the last thing that i used and you can simulate the paper and ink so let's change that first let's change to the Canon profile which when we installed it for Photoshop it's available for Lightroom so we'll select that and you can see the nature of the photo changed a little bit since it's a projector as opposed to a paper that we're printing on uh, also in Photoshop we had out of gamut warnings we have the same thing here you turn them on using the top of the histogram and if you hover over this little square, it will show the out of gamut warnings. If you remove your cursor, they'll uh, go away. Or you can click on that and the out of gamut warnings will stay on. Now, to do the same thing that we did before, to do a side-by-side uh, -side comparison to the original photo, and a new photo instead of duplicating it we're going to create what's called a virtual copy in Lightroom and you do that here just by saying create proof copy and you can see that it added the profile to the end of the file name and it also shows that we have relative rendering intent selected which is selected right here so that's fine but how do we get the side by side if you look down at the bottom you have these uh, two rectangles that say why and it says cycles before and after if you click on that we're going to have a before of the photo and an after that we're actually working on so you'll have a photo to compare against how close that we're getting the next thing, then this is probably the biggest difference between Photoshop and Lightroom. If you remember in Photoshop, I was able to target some of my adjustments just to the background by using layers and layer masks. Well, that doesn't exist in Lightroom. The uh, closest thing we have to layers is an adjustment brush where we can target certain areas with adjustments. However, there is a limitation. Only certain tools are allowed to be used on the adjustment brush. If you remember in Photoshop, we used levels and hue and saturation and uh, some contrast to make the changes targeted just to the background. Well, levels and the hue, saturation, and luminance are not some of the tools that are on the adjustment brush. So we're going to have to go at this a little differently in Photoshop. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and select our adjustment brush up here. And you can see the panel opens and what is included that you can target an adjustment with. What we're going to do is uh, paint this background. So let me make my brush a little bigger by using the right bracket key. And so I can see what I'm doing a little better. Uh, down here, there's a checkbox that shows uh, the mask overlay. You can turn on and off, or you can hit O on your keyboard. So when you paint, you get this little red overlay. You can see what you're doing. I'm going to turn off the out of gamut so we can see the painting. So what you want to do is come and paint this background. And it 
doesn't have to be super exact, but if you spill over, like on the ear there, hold the Alt key down and you'll see this negative appear and you can erase what you painted. So I think you get the idea. So instead of uh, watching me paint this whole thing through the magic of video, we're going to speed this up. Okay, now that we've painted in our background and uh, will only affect our background when we make our adjustments, we can hit the O key again so we can uh, take the overlay off and we'll put our gamut warnings back on. And uh, one of the things that is available in the uh, adjustment tool is saturation. So we're going to bring that down. You can see it immediately... Uh, gets rid of the out of gamut now you can see the green is a lot duller than our reference photo here but we haven't affected any of the colors on uh, the caracal so what we're going to do now is try to bring some of this back first we hit done here to finish our adjustment brush and we're going to go to our uh, HSL panel hue saturation and luminance and open that up and I have it clicked for all here so I can see the the different panels all at once let's try saturation first and what we're going to do is up here in the left hand corner you see adjust the saturation by dragging in the photo so we're going to select that tool and we're going to pick an area one of the areas that was uh, causing us a problem was right here so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, click on that and we're going to push up you can see it's bringing back some of the out of gamut but you're, they're usually in the shadow areas so that's not too bad but now that green is a lot closer than it was before uh, so I think the next thing we're going to do to make this pop a little bit is bring some of the luminance back and so we're going to do the same thing select that tool on the luminance panel and pop that a little bit it's not the exact shade of green not as saturated but we're not going to be able to get it as saturated for the projector however it's pretty close uh, and our shadows are still maintained and what we would do now is we've adjusted this photo as close as we can get it to the reference photo so now we would go into our export menu like we did in the earlier part of the video and export this proof on the right this virtual copy that we have made and you'll be able to tell by the title here because it has the Canon uh, ICC profile appended to it and we're going to export that as a JPEG in the sRGB color space and this is what it's going to look like on the projector so you can be assured uh, what kind of image that you're going to have projected. We presented a lot of information in this video so let's take a moment and recap. First we described our digital competition environment about our Canon projector and how we set it up. We described the size and color space for images for the Canon projector. We demonstrated how to resize your image to the Canon specifications using Photoshop and Lightroom. We demonstrated converting the image's color space to the Canon's color space using Photoshop and Lightroom. We talked about how we calibrated our Canon projector and how that resulting profile is available on the Memphis Camera Club website for download. 
we demonstrated soft proofing against that color profile using Photoshop and Lightroom and making adjustments to your image so it comes closer to the way you edited it originally. Now for anybody participating in our monthly competitions, the details are available on our website and in the handbook. So if you go to memphiscameraclub.com and select the competition menu up at the top and then select guidelines, we have a page that summarizes the whole competition procedure both for digital and print. And if you're going to participate in competition, I highly recommend you read that entire page. We also have a more detailed document which has all our rules and regs for competition and you can find that again on our website if you click on the about us menu then documents then club documents there's a PDF of our handbook that you can download and that is what our competition chairman used to decide uh, if an image complies with our rules or not well I hope this video helped you and I want to thank you for watching. I'd also encourage you to go at the bottom there and click on our subscribe button and then click on the little bell icon so you'll be notified anytime the Memphis Camera Club posts a video. Thanks again and see you at competition.